In 2002, the chess scene was thrown in a frenzy when the then world champion accused one of his opponents of cheating. Chess speaks for itself. This resulted in a series of internet drama videos, several independent investigations and a defamation lawsuit. Now, did Hans Niemann cheat? I don't know, nor does it matter for the purposes of the video. What I am more interested in is the nature of how one can cheat in chess. And no, this won't be another generic butt plug making video. Instead, I will focus on the tool which facilitates the cheating, a brief history of them and how to make one chess engine at home. This is one of the most significant moments in chess and AI history. On the left we have Garry Kasparov who at the time was the current world chess champion and even to this day is considered to be one of the greatest chess players to have ever lived. On the right we have Deep Blue. This is not some bizarre hippie name for the man standing there. This is actually an IBM researcher. Deep Blue is the name of the rather big and bulky machine standing behind him, designed for the only purpose of playing chess. You can see Kasparov holding his head in his hands as he's lost what move to make next. This is the first time in history that a machine has beaten the world chess champion in a standard tournament. However, this was not the first time a computer has beaten a human. Nearly 20 years prior, Cray Blitz became the first engine to win a state championship against the Grandmaster and the first engine to achieve an ELO above 2200, making it an officially recognized international master. Not Grandmaster yet, but give it time and the computers will certainly be there. Fair and square, they will climb the ratings and soon they will be easily beating even grandmasters in the world. Chess engines continue to improve by leaps and bounds and now 26 years after Deep Blue, chess is ruled by the machine. Openings are discarded because engines said so. Alpha Zero borderline refuted the French defense. Theories are built upon their evaluation. But how do they work? How do humans make such unstoppable solvers? And what do their evaluations even mean? Before we get to the fun part of making a solver, or rather you copy-pasting a solution and claiming you understand chess engines, we need to understand the taxonomy of games. I will borrow much of these terms and their definition from the field of game theory. Games can thus be distinguished based on several characteristics. The numbers of players playing, single player, two player, etc. Whether they are cooperative or non-cooperative. The payoff types, how players can perform their moves, sequentially or simultaneously, and what information is present to the player, is it perfect or is it partial. For example, the game Catan is multiplayer as we have many participants, non-cooperative as each player is trying to win, general sum as players can benefit without this negatively affecting others, sequential as players take turns, and perfect information since the entire board is seen at all times by all players. Dota 2, on the other hand, is multiplayer, non-cooperative, zero-sum, as any team's advantage is the other team's disadvantage, simultaneous, players make move together without following an order, and imperfect information, they do not always know each other's locations. Chess, the game we are primarily interested in, is a two-player, non-cooperative, zero-sum, sequential, perfect information game. Knowing this classification helps us identify games similar to chess, such as Connect 4, Shogi, and Tic-Tac-Toe. While the game mechanics of each of these drastically differ, one can employ the same algorithm and techniques when playing them. In fact, this particular class of games are really well suited for a well-developed algorithm, Minimax. Minimax is a special variant of backwards induction, if you're familiar with that one from your economics classes. As the name suggests, we will analyze the game backwards. Let's consider an example from Tic-Tac-Toe. A very simple game with quite a few possible positions, which makes it very easy to reason about without the help of any computers. Imagine you are playing with your friend, taking turns to put your X's and O's until you have gotten to this position. Most people who know the rules of this game will see this position and tell you it is a draw. Great, but how did you get to this fact? If you could sketch out your thought process, you could easily create a program for a computer which can tell you the same fact. Fortunately for you, in 1875, people already wrote out an algorithm or a sequence of steps, which when followed will help you analyze any game without needing to know the game-specific information. Backwards induction works as follows. As we can see from the number of X's and O's, it is X's turn. Now, he can cross any of these three boxes, each resulting in a different board state. Let's see how the game will progress if the player puts it in the top square. Well, on the other player's turn, he can make a choice between either of these two bottom boxes. Whatever they play, X can respond with only one move. As we see, if all responded by playing in the bottom right, X would win. Thus we denote the outcome of this sequence of moves as plus one, for X's victory. For O's other choice, the game would end in a draw, so we put down a zero. If player two, or O, had won, by convention we would put minus one. We do the same for all initial choices, and we end up with what our complete game tree would look like. 
We now begin evaluating the tree backwards. Since x's last move is forced, we can simply transfer the scores of the final positions to their predecessors, as neither player can change the outcome at this point. There is only one possible move. Now we have all the possible second to last positions, which all can achieve after our turn. We assume O wants to win, or at best to draw, if they can. And we assume that O understands fully the principles of the game. Therefore, given O's possible choices, here they would like to make a choice that would lead them to a board where outcome is minus 1. If that is not possible, then 0 for draw can work. And if nothing else, well, plus 1 they will be forced to accept. Thus, player 2 is trying to minimize the outcome, or they are trying to pick the board with minimal value. So given this board for example, they have a choice between either getting a draw or losing. For them it would be better to draw, so this move they should pick. We do this for all other configurations where it's player 2's turn. Now player 1 has a choice between 3 moves. Assuming that the opponent will not make a mistake on their turn, the choices are between drawing, losing or losing. Player 1 does not want to lose, so they will pick the next best thing, a draw. Player 1 is thus trying to maximize the score of a board, and hence the name of the algorithm, Minimax. One player tries to get the outcome as high as possible. Win for them is plus 1 or a draw, and if nothing else minus 1, while the other one as low as possible. Minus 1 for their win, 0 for a draw, and plus 1 for their opponent's victory. And that is the algorithm. That is how most chess engines work. It is a pretty intuitive algorithm, fortunately. Most of the times humans evaluate their choices in such games in much the same manner. The main strength of this algorithm is that you don't need to know the previous moves. It doesn't matter whether this position was achieved like this or in some other manner like this. What matters is the current possible outcomes, since they'll be the same regardless of the path we took to get here. This is great to know, but how does this apply to chess? I mean, tic-tac-toe is a simple game. Even children can evaluate it fully from a starting position and know it will be a draw. It has only about 8,000 game positions. Chess, on the other hand, has 10 to the power of 123 possible positions. The number of atoms in the observable universe is about 10 to the power of 82. If for every chess position you had an atom, you could make 10 to the power of 41 universes. That is one with 41 zeros after it. And that is that many different universes you could construct. There are too many positions for any computer to consider, let alone any human. So how do these chess engines do it? Well, they cheat, kinda. You see, what they do is they evaluate 6, 10 or some number of moves ahead and then they stop. And if you end on a position like this, how can you tell what the outcome is? Well, you estimate. Or if you want to be proper, you apply a heuristic. You look at the current position and do some observations which then give you some advantage score for one of the two players. It is much how humans operate actually. Of course, the art is in finding a good way to estimate a position. The better and more detailed your evaluation is, the better your moves will be. The main focus of modern chess engine is in optimizations and designing good heuristics. And that is pretty much the essence of chess engines. They play all possible moves until they reach an end position or until some maximum depth is reached, and then they apply minimax to pick the next best move. Let's do the fun part and actually make a solver. Um, I have a confession to make. I lied to you. We will not be making a chess solver. Instead, we will be making a Connect4 solver. Why? Connect4 is also a solved game. We know that if both players play perfectly, no matter what player 2 does, player 1 will win. This makes building this toy solver much easier since we can evaluate how close to optimal does it play. Also, since Connect4 is of the same class as chess, everything we do here can easily be done for chess. Let's first begin with a very simple Connect4 program which simply lets us make a move and give us the resulting board state. We also add a few win condition checks and bam, you can now play this with a friend. But that wasn't our goal. We need to now make a computer player for those who have no friends to play or those who want to cheat, though the overlap between the two groups is quite large. First we begin by creating some code which will build the game tree by evaluating all subsequent moves. Since Connect4 is quite a large game, having a million possible positions after only 4 moves by each side, we will stop our search after 8 moves in depth. Thus we will need some form of a way to evaluate our boards if we have not reached a final stage, that is if neither player has won or it's not a draw. Here I have outlined what our evaluation or our heuristic will constitute. We will look at each disc and if it is in the middle position we will add 7 to the score of the board. If it is a player 2 disc we will subtract 7. This goes for the entire heuristic. For player 1 disc we add, for player 2 we subtract since it is a zero sum game. 
If the disc is in the column next to the middle one, we will add 3 to the score. The next two we add 1 and the last columns we add 0. Now we will look in the row, column and two diagonals. If we have successfully connected three discs of our color and on both of these sides there are empty spaces, we add 1000. If one of the sides is blocked but the other is empty, we add 33. If both sides are blocked, well, then we don't add anything. I mean, this seems quite logical, right? That's how you would play Connect4 as well. If you have successfully connected three of your discs and you have two open spaces on each side, that gives you quite a good space to connect four. So your opponent's now first priority is to not allow you to place a disc in one of the two open spaces. If you have connected three discs and there is only one space available on both sides, well, there is still some room for you to connect the four together, though it is much harder now as your opponent needs to block only one square. If you have connected three discs but both sides are blocked, well, there is not much you can do with this sequence. Thus, I hope this gives you some intuitiveness as to why these numbers were chosen for our heuristic. Going on, if we have connected two with both sides open, we add five. And that concludes our heuristic. The numbers are largely arbitrary, but they do work. However, I am sure you could find a better combination of numbers which gives you a better heuristic. We apply this heuristic for each disc on the board and this gives us our final score for the board. The lower this score is, the better it is for player 2 and the higher it is, the better for player 1. This pretty much has finalized our bot. You can now play against it or use it to play against other people. I can tell you from experience it's not that trivial to beat it. In my own personal tests, when I let the bot play against me or friends, it can successfully beat them in about 75% to 80% of the games. That is an incredible win percentage. Magnus Carlsen, who is one of the best chess players ever, has in comparison only 42.34% chance of a win. Now, our bot is admittedly not perfect. If you let it play against an optimal solver, such as the one available here, it loses pretty much every game. But I think a win rate of above 70% against human players is already indicative enough of its power. We are not over yet though. It is 2023 and of course everything has to be done with deep learning. Since 2020, every major chess engine uses a deep neural network to evaluate their positions. Why make a heuristic when you can just let the computer figure out one for you? So let's do the same. Here I have a very basic neural network which evaluates a given board. At the end it will return three values. The first one indicates the certainty it has that player two will win. The middle one indicates its certainty that the game will end in a draw, and the last one, the certainty that player 1 will win. I trained it on this marvelous dataset I constructed, which consists of a board state and which player will win it given optimal play. After a few hours of training, we have a pretty decent result. The deep learning network unfortunately does not distinguish between a tie and a win for player 2. But this is actually not too big of an issue, because it is actually expected that player 2 will lose given optimal play, player 2, if they can, should go for a tie, since that is better than them losing. Letting the two compete against each other, well, the heuristic one still performs slightly better than the deep learning one, beating it in most of the cases. However, I did not try to make that good of a deep learning network and this was a very, very shallow and very simple one. Plus, the goal here was not to make a perfect solver. It was more about understanding how solvers work. Still, the bot based on deep learning was able to perform quite well against human players, though with a much, much lower win percentage rate of about 41%. I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it's very different from the videos I typically make, but hey, I'm very passionate about chess and game solver, so here you go, a combination of the two. If you enjoyed the video and you found it interesting or informative, please consider leaving a like and subscribing. And if you're interested in building a solver for yourself, well, you can find my code down in the description and you can use it as a basis to build your own solver, either for Connect4 or for chess if you decide to do so. So thank you for watching and remember to pay tribute to our AI overlords.